questions that are being asked I'd like to mostly address, so this is my preference, is questions that affect how you walk. Questions about living this out. What he's always told me is, tell them that if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, they'll be where they're supposed to be. But you need a teacher to teach you what it is you need to be doing. Okay, so we're going to begin with Mercy. Thanks, Rabbi Steve. Uh, so I have two quick questions. Um, the first one is, when we talk about Moshe and Aharon, and Aharon is part of the Kohanim. Right. And I know that we always talk about Moshe as being Melchizedek, right? Well, of the Melchizedek, of the Melchizedek. order. However, something I thought about was, if they're brothers, wouldn't he also be part of the Kohanim? Okay, so the Kohanim, when it was established, starts with Aaron. Okay. Not with Levi, with Aaron. Okay, okay remember, the other Levites had other roles. Mm -hmm. Okay, you had the Merari and the Kohathites and the We had these other roles. It's the Aaronic ones, the ones that were from Aaron that had very specifically the Kohanim role. Okay. So it starts actually with him. Okay. Okay, now Levi as a whole is given priestly duties. Mm -hmm. But that, that high priest role, that Kohanim role, was given to the sons of Aaron. So Moses is a brother of Aaron, not a son of Aaron. Mm -hmm. Okay? And also, from the Melchizedekian point of view, genealogy makes no difference. Okay. okay, so you can have two brothers. They could have both, yeah, let's say they were both sons of Aaron. One could still end up doing the Melchizedekian role, and the other could be doing a Levitical role. So you, but in this case, with Aaron and Moses, you have actually the high priest of the Levitical and at that point, the high priest of the Melchizedekian happen to be brothers and working together. Interesting. Okay? okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you. And then the second one, I don't want you, I'm going to say, here's my disclaimer. I'm not trying to get you to go into eschatology. Eschatology. Well, I'm, I'm not, not trying I, to do that. I've never been an, I've never been an esthetician, so right. I can't do eschatology. But I do want a facial. Um, so... Okay, so it's going to okay, sound you, you, like you I didn't want, You really didn't want to set that one up for me, did you? Come on, we can play tennis. Boop. <laughs> um, I, it's going to sound like I do, but it was just an observation that I had. All right. So, if we know that the greater exodus is going to, like I said, be greater than the one that we, that's accounted for in, in the Torah, then when we're talking about the two witnesses... I was watching a movie last night, and it was one of the Bible movies that I have not seen. I don't know how that was possible, but I hadn't seen this Bible movie. And they showed Moshe and Aharon really working in concert together when they were coming before Pharaoh, which was right. something different that I hadn't seen. So if we're talking about the greater exodus, which is supposed to be like the first one, only greater, so then the two witnesses, is that why... Is that why Yah had Aaron and Moses working together? Because he knew that in the greater exodus there were going to be these two witnesses? If it's supposed to be the same, like, you know what I mean? No. No? Okay. No. All right, look, I think you're going to find that the two witnesses has to do with the idea that to establish something, you need two to three witnesses. So you need two saying the same thing. That's probably why you also have Moses and Aaron doing it, okay? But it's for that reason, not for the fact that there's going to be these two witnesses at the end. But two witnesses witnessing to the same exact thing, okay, that's how they establish something as being true, right? Two to three witnesses to establish something. Okay. okay. Does that help? Well, yes. So then, so I know that they die. They're killed. Um, and is there a reason why, because obviously we all assume, the assumption is that it's going to be Enoch and... Um, Elijah, because those are the only two that we know of that have never tasted death. So is it because they're going to end up dying in, halfway through that he needed two people who w never tasted death to then finally die? Like he couldn't raise somebody up who already died and then bring them back and then have them die a second, death, se a second time. So is that kind of why he's doing the whole Enoch and Elijah thing? It doesn't say anywhere that he's doing any knocking. No, Elijah I know. Thing. That's that's been no, the assumption. Look, well, look, there's been a lot of assumptions. Okay, um, you know, people even will say John because they don't have anything with John either. 
Okay, he was just out there writing the book of Revelation and we don't hear much else after that. But the thing is, what you have is there are going to be two. Those could be two that are living at that time who still haven't tasted death, okay? And by the way, it doesn't say that these two, Enoch and Elijah, never tasted death. They just didn't die as men would. They were taken away and who knows whatever happened with that. But they didn't tell us anything more. We just know that they were, they were taken, okay? So that being said, the last times, when we get to those end times, you have these two witnesses. The two witnesses are going to go through the same kind of thing that Yeshua did in that they're going to show that the power that they're witnessing to is stronger than death. That you can't kill it. Okay? And that the power can then resurrect and bring back to life. Because remember, they're witnessing to a reality that the world had not really experienced for the last 2,000 years. We, we hear about it, we read about it, but we haven't really experienced it except that small group of people when Yeshua resurrected. And so these witnesses get killed and then they resurrect. And so this becomes this very big deal, right? And so I don't think that, well, first of all, I'm pretty sure we don't know who they are. And I'm not really convinced that it's not going to be more of the role. In other words, you're going to get whoever's in that Elijah role likely okay, to be one of those witnesses. I don't know who the other one might be, um, but I think you're going to see because we're told about pre-Yeshua, there's always this Elijah role. There was before he came in the flesh, there will be again before he comes again. And so I can see that being, you know, a part of what's coming, okay? But I could also see it being a person. I'm not claiming it's me. My wife's very happy I don't do that. <laughs> Only especially because she doesn't want to see me get pointed the finger at and killed and everything, which you all know I could care less. But the thing is, the point of the, of, the, of the end time is it's going to be whoever is given the role to stand up and say at the, at the false one, he's not it. <laughs> That's not Messiah. While the rest of the world is bowing down and worshiping him, which is what gets them killed because he blasphemes against the blasphemer. <laughs> and so it's got to be somebody, or two somebodies, who are working in harmony with each other, as you said, Aaron and Moses, who is going to stand up there and say, do not be deceived, that guy ain't it. Don't look, I know he's doing signs and wonders and all this other, he's not the one. Repent. And all the other message that goes along with that end time message that you get the witnesses talking about. And then they get killed for their efforts, like all the other prophets. I don't know why anybody would want to be a prophet. They all get killed, pretty much, because they're always so popular. But it's going to be a role, I believe, more than let's try to figure out what person in history that already existed it's going to be. People like to go to the Mount of Transfiguration and say, oh, well, look, we saw these ones here on the Mount. That's maybe something. You know, I know a lot of people want to use that as their justification for what they think. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it matters. I think what matters is what they're saying. That's how you know who they are. Not because you'll recognize and say, oh, look, it's Enoch and Elijah. How do you know what they look like anyway? Okay? Well, you know, in Genesis, there's a picture. No, there's no pictures, okay? All right? So... I think it's going to be that you need to know how to recognize the role. Now, you know where they're going to be. It says where they're going to be doing this. You know the message generally that they're going to be sharing. So you should be looking for that. And by the way, for all the end time people that are all talking about all these things, they're all going to fall short and fall for the false one if they're not waiting and looking for the ones who will be standing there pointing at the false one. Now, of course whatever the phony false one might be, they might get their own little mock-up of witnesses trying to point at them, but you have to know the truth. You have to know what you're really looking for. Go listen to that Beware of False Prophets teaching over and over so you kind of know what I'm talking about so that you know what to expect. Okay, but it's a good question. It's not really one of those eschatology things because, I, look, I don't get into the naming of dates and trying to say this and this and this, but I think it is important to know that there are going to be two incredibly powerfully uh, anointed witnesses to that the false one is the false one and not Messiah. Because they're not witnessing Messiah specifically because he's not there yet. They're the ones witnessing the one you think is Messiah is not him. 
Now that's a, that's, that's a role for the ages, really, because you're gonna be doing that when the whole world, with the technology we have and everything else, is believing this guy's the Messiah. And so this is going to be why they don't care that he sits in the Holy of Holies and creates the abomination of desolation and sets himself up as God, because he'll be doing such amazing things. And then you're gonna stand up there as a witness and say, but he's not it. But not even that gentle, because you're falling for that false prophet, for that beast power, that's gonna put you right in the fire. And he's gonna, they're gonna stand out there at the top of the lungs saying, please don't do this. Don't buy into this false thing. So why do people buy into it? Why are people gonna buy into this false one? Because he's going to do the things he wants them, that they want him to do. Okay? If there was another choice other than Yeshua that did, uh, started a military you know, upheaval, kind of like Bar Kokhba or something later, had there been one at Yeshua's time, that's where Judas would have gone. Okay, because he would have gone to the one that was gonna do it the way he was hoping and desiring it to be done. So this false Messiah is gonna come and please everybody, at least initially, <laughs> before you're totally enslaved and trapped and screwed up. You need to understand that your emotional immaturity ultimately is going to get you killed because that's what's going to be susceptible to the false. So you have to grow yourself emotionally because it's the emotions that are going to get played on by the false. Does that make sense? And so it's that level of emotional maturity that is going to make all the difference when you see the false and your emotions go, yeah, and then somewhere in the back of your mind that small voice goes, no. I know it looks like you're gonna get everything you always hoped for and wanted, but no, that's not him. And that's the key. Okay, we have to see that. All right, Shama Steve. Okay, let's talk about, I, I saw something on the, on Facebook the other day that kind of got me a little riled because I know the person and I know they know you and I felt that their posts or their what they had done kind of was a gear toward you but I know I like the meat and potatoes that you serve so rather than the milk so let's talk about how you how you're serving what Abba has given you rather than coddling us to baby feed us and stuff like that I so tell, I know there's a lot of people maybe you're new to you or new to your style, but I, I like the strength that comes from the mic from you and even in counseling or at other times that I've dealt with you for, geez, almost nine years now. So why don't you tell people how you are and how we should see you even though I know you're not perfect. I was shocked when I found out I wasn't, so. <laughs> None of the rest of us were. Um, so, <laughs> look, look, I appreciate that very much. I don't, I don't know how the best way to describe what's different with me. I, I'll give you what I think is different. I think what's different is what I'm driven by and what I care about. I don't care about your accolades. I don't care about being popular. I don't care about numbers on the screen. Oh, we talk about them because they are markers to measure our effectiveness, but we, I don't care about them. If they're higher or lower, they don't make an emotional you know, difference to me. So the motivation that I have is pure, and that pure motivation is that you have everything you need and somebody encouraging you as hard as they can, like a coach would, you know, who's training you, like a personal trainer, to get it done, that you can do it, okay? And so, because of that, I can say things that nobody else says because I don't care. I'm not selling you anything. I don't care if you decide you don't want to buy my CDs. I don't have any for sale. I don't care if you don't want to buy my, my videos and books. I don't have any for sale. I don't, you know what I'm saying? I don't have anything that would alter and have me edit what I do. Because I've sat with and been at conferences with other teachers and watched them kind of edit themselves as they're talking and be very reluctant to answer certain questions because they may not be popular with some people the way they would answer it. So rather, they avoid 
Because after all, even if it's not in a conscious way, they know this could affect their ability to pay for their bills, their ability to make a living. And so, and there are people that's funny, new people will find me every, every now and then and say, well, we just pray that you don't change the way you're doing things. I only do things one way, okay? I don't do this by, on purpose. In other words, this is not like I consciously decided I'm gonna do this, this is just me. Okay, this is the way I talk, this is the way I teach. Ask Elder, he's with me all day long, this is the way I talk, this is the way I teach. That, that unrelenting, you know, straightforward, blunt, you know, effective approach is always what I do. But the reason I do it, thank you, someone said praise you. But the reason I do it that way is because my driver is my looking him in the eye one day saying I did everything to help you get where you need to go. Okay? And by help, I don't mean that I got in, you know, in your business and like was making you do anything, but like I gave you all the information and all the encouragement and all the understanding so that you would know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, etc., and then you could then make the choice to do it. I didn't want to have anything ever come back on me. Well, but you know, you, you kind of beat around the bush and you're all nice and this. Of course they, no, no, I'm going to not sugarcoat anything for you. Look, we're talking about life and death. <laughs> okay, this is not like we're talking about, do you want to go to you know, a resort or a vacation somewhere? Do you want to go on a cruise or do you want to go to some hotel resort? No, we're not choosing. This is life or death. Pretty serious. And what you do, contrary to what you've been told your whole life in the church, but what you do is going to make the difference as to what you get. <laughs> Not just what you believe informationally, but what you believe functionally. You believe it so you walk in it. You do it. So that's why I teach the way I do. But I also have that freedom that I never was ever concerned about how it may or may not affect money in a box. Okay, and I can tell you when we first started, there was not always money in the box. As a matter of fact, we always kind of opened it up like, let's see, nothing. Okay, <laughs> you know, it was never a consistent thing, but it changed nothing. I taught no differently because I, I felt like if I had to just do make money a different way, I'd make money a different way. I didn't worry about it from a money point of view. I don't. So the two things that I think screw up ministries more than anything else is the money part and the somehow the popularity part. Okay. I, I love the praise that I get from people saying how much they appreciate that I was blunted in their face. That's different than saying, we just think you're so wonderful. No, I see, I don't need all that popularity things. But someone telling me, thank you so much for being willing to get right in my face and tell me how I need to see and put that mirror in my face, that, that feeds my moving forward, okay? The appreciation that what I'm doing is working that way. But popularity, look, I, you all know this. You've seen me get into semi-entertainer mode. You know, when we're just get letting loose a little bit and I, I make a few jokes. Look, I could have an audience as big as I want if I wanted to. I could be as entertaining as anybody and get up here and make everybody feel good and tickle all the ears. You know, it's really funny. One guy one time in Nashville, we had a small congregation in Nashville, this was about 20 years ago, and a guy was sitting next to Rebitson and some other people during the service, only about 20 people in the service, and he looked at her and he said, you know, your husband's very good. If he would just take this on to Sunday, he'd be huge. <laughs> and she looked at him and said, have you listened to anything he said? <laughs> and you think that would work on Sunday? He was just noticing my rapport with the people but didn't understand that that rapport was to make the strength of the other stuff palatable, okay? Get to laugh a little bit, but you're always laughing at looking at yourself in reality, You're not laughing as I'm just telling a joke, okay? See, I don't do the other ministry, like most popular Christian ministries, they get up there, tell a story, tell a joke, use maybe a verse, and then move on, right? Okay, I'm, I'm using some humor by having you look at yourself and life in a real, a real way. And then you laugh because you realize, wow, that's so true. My life is exactly that. My parents were that way, or my kids were that way, or I was this way as a kid. So it's that reality that makes you laugh. So it's teaching still, even though you're getting some humor, but it's never to just tell a joke. Okay, I don't tell jokes. I mean, I have, a few, I have a pretty good humor and I make people laugh quite a bit, but it's not telling a joke. It's getting them to look at things in a certain way, and especially when I say things that they just don't expect to come out of a microphone. 
That's what I usually get elder with. And he sits there going, <laughs> he just like, I, you know. And if you're ever counseling with the two of us, just know at least one of those is coming sometime during the session. Because I always like to sit there going along, and he thinks it's all good and comfortable. And all of a sudden, bam, and he looks, I look over, and he's like, <laughs> you know, he just like, <laughs> and I just, because that's part of my entertainment. <laughs> OK? But you got to understand that that's, that's rare. I'm not saying that in any bragging way. I'm saying it's rare. Look, to be blunt, I teach the way I'd want to hear it. Okay, if I was sitting where you are, I'd want someone talking the way I do. I'd want someone to speak straight, in my face, don't beat around the bush, don't sugarcoat it, don't, just tell me what it is. All right? What am I doing wrong? What do I need to do right? How do I do it? What's the right process? What matters? What doesn't matter? Give me that straight stuff that I can apply right now. Okay? Because I did have somebody the other day mention to me like, yeah, we just found you a couple of months ago and, and you know, we noticed you were different in that you know, we could actually remember what you said and it actually affects our lives every day. I said, because I don't teach things that are just interesting. I don't cover things just because they're required to cover because they may be fascinating to somebody. Everything is about you becoming him. Okay, everything, which is why if you listen to a teaching, it will affect you when you leave if you were paying attention. It'll affect you the next day. You'll still be thinking of some of the things that you heard. Whereas a lot of teachers I listen to, just to check different people out, I don't remember anything they said the next day. If you ask me what they were teaching about, I'm like, I'm not sure. Because nothing stuck. Because there wasn't anything to stick. There was just a lot of interesting information. And I'm not into that. Okay, we do the color code things, the personality things. I'm all about accomplishing things and results, right? That full red color thing. Well, guess what? The result I want for you is well done, good and trustworthy servant. Okay, so teaching you a bunch of fluffy, interesting things isn't necessarily going to get that. <laughs> okay, you got to become him, and I got to keep encouraging you that you can and what you need to do to do it. All right, Sarah Beth. Okay, so... I think I made a connection and saw something I'd never seen before. I'd like to ask you okay. to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, connecting how you as a leader have given us so much freedom to grow at our own speed and you're not controlling and you've taught us to be our authentic self um, and then you've taught on the man's role is to create the safe space for the family, the woman, the children to flourish and how the vertical shows us the father is supposed to, then am I correct in saying Abba's done the same thing as the man should be doing in creating this world, this space for us to grow into what we can be, and that's what free will is about? Yes. Um, when we look at this from a role point of view, right, the reason that the creator uses the term father, okay, to refer to himself, is because of the role that we would understand. So that, that leadership, headship of the man has a role of providing. Now, don't we think of our creator as the ultimate in providing? We also think of that role as protector. Well, is not the father, the father, the ultimate protector. And so then, if we're going to be in ministry or within our own families, we have to then try to do those roles as he would have them done. So we are providers and we are protectors. But we're also providing not just things like food and shelter, but the space that is protected to do the growing in. I mean, he created a world that he gives us the space to grow in. Now, it's not always safe because he's allowed the world now to not be his world because he's, and go listen to the teaching, right? Peace in the world, not his. So this world, which is, he's allowing it to be ours right now and showing us how bad that works because this is a leadership world, a leadership-less world, okay? It lacks that role in most of our lives. Almost every woman and almost every man, actually, that I, call, that I uh, counsel with, has had tremendous damage done 
or they're suffering tremendous deficiencies in understanding how to be what they're supposed to be because they didn't have role models. Their, their fathers weren't role models. Their mothers weren't, they didn't have role models. They didn't know what this was supposed to look like. Who did they have in their life that did this well that they could look at and go, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like. And we wonder why the world is in such a mess when there's so, so few role models to look at. I mean, the amount of women that I talk to, and again, you would not know these things unless you either had the problem and started doing research online or unless you were counseling, but the amount of women that had just horrific father figures in their lives, if there even was a father. They may not even have been one in so many cases. Or there was one, but they weren't really there, so even though it was, but they wasn't. And then you could take it to the next level where there was actual verbal or emotional abuse, or to the next level where there was physical abuse or even sexual abuse all coming from the role that was supposed to be providing and protecting. And then you marry one of them and you wonder why they have so many issues. Not their fault. I mean, you're now the man trying to come into their life and all they know is men are really messed up. <laughs> At least they messed up their lives, the men in their lives. And now you're supposed to now come in and be like, but I'm different. And maybe you are, but how do they know? They don't know what different is. Because maybe they've already had four or five experiences with men and they were all similar. Because those men all imitated what they saw and what they learned and what they knew. So they don't know how to do it. Then you don't know how to do the women's side because you didn't have any women. Uh, two things, you didn't have A, women examples, and B, a man to give you a role to give you the flourishing place to become the woman. Well, you have the freedom to go ahead and be that. What a terrible mess we live in. And so, yes, when we look at the things from the above, we're supposed to be imitating them in the below. And that's why, you know, it's, it's almost like a running joke, but it's not a joke at all. I take very seriously the fact that I've got, you know, like a half a dozen daughters that are not my daughters of all different ages because they need a papa or whatever they, you know, some call me dad, some call me papa, whatever it is, but they need that. And they've never experienced it before. And it's a very big blessing for me to be able to do that. I know it might sound weird to some people, but you know what? I'm watching some people come out of tremendous pain and suffering because of it. Just knowing, just knowing they have someone to be there. And by the way, it's not like I go and take them on daddy-daughter dates and things. I'm just saying I'm there that they know there's someone they can call. There's someone that can give them the counsel. There's someone that could give them encouragement in the strength that a father role can give them. Okay? And I watched the healing start to come. And while at one point, on I mean, on one level, I appreciate the opportunity and what a blessing it is for me, but also how sad it always is to me that I have to do that and there wasn't that man in their life to do that beforehand. In other words, that they had to wait till they got to 40, 50, 60 years old, meet me, and finally have somebody they can try to understand what a father role can look like. See, men, some of you may understand this because you had abusive fathers too, but it's really hard when you've had an abusive father to get into the Bible and you start, start, you start looking at the, the New Testament, you're supposed to say, Father, our Father in the heavens, everything's about the Father, and you're like, that term doesn't work for me because all I have is bad connected to that term. How am I supposed to love the Father when I don't know what that means? I have no idea what that looks like. I have never experienced love and Father in the same concept. And then we're supposed to have that. Or some of you had abusive brothers, and now you have Yeshua. Oh, I love my older brother. Yeshua's our big brother. No, my big brother used to take me into the bedroom when I was five and do whatever. Yeah, that's things that people are experiencing. And now I'm supposed to understand how we look at Yeshua as older brother. I don't know what older brother looks like. It was, it was dangerous, it was bad, it was abusive, it was horrible, it was a nightmare. This is the kind of healing that the body is trying to go through, you know? You know, we, we, we often call ourselves, you know, a messianic congregation, but the MC really stands for mental clinic. <laughs> We're really like a mental health clinic because all of us are walking damaged, wounded people. And it's not, it's not, because people will come and say, well, I'm being under spiritual attack and everything's spiritual. It's not all spiritual, it's literal. You experience these things physically. They weren't demons doing this. It was your brother, your father, your mother, your sister, your cousin, whoever it was. 
These are people doing it. Oh no, the demons must have been. No, these are people doing it. You know what you read history? People are capable of some really awful things. Which is probably why Abba gives us a finite life. So if we're going to do awful things, we just get to die and that's it. Okay? But I think that's really important that we understand. That's why I think it's really important for all of you men, especially, to understand, well, let me rephrase that, to go out and seek to understand what you're supposed to do and do it the best you can. I can't tell you how many men come into this kind of a thing, like a, like a religious thing where they start getting their vertical beliefs going, and the first thing they want to do is become macho, not a man. I'm the man. And they walk around and strut around, and you need to listen to me. I'm the man. That is not a man. Okay, that's a blowhard. That's a prideful egomania. I don't know what that is. That is not a man. A man is. A man doesn't have to say it and speak it. He just is a man. Okay? And so people know you're a man because of your being one. Not because you're saying and demanding that people treat you and respect you like one. Be one, you'll get respected. So if you're having to constantly demand it, you might not be being one. But you think you're one, so you want to, be, so you want to demand it. Be a man. Ladies, same thing. Well, I don't know how to be a wife. Then you got to learn how to be a wife, how to be a woman. Part of the problem, though, is because the men have dropped the ball so badly, you're trying to be the man. And so men, don't get mad at your wives when they act like men. It's probably your fault anyway. Because they're just stepping in where you didn't do what you needed to do. See, but then the light bulb goes on, and all of a sudden you want to be that, and she doesn't know how to let you anymore. And then you're all mad at her. She's like, but I've been married to you for 35 years. Now you're going to step up? Well, I can't just let go of the reins that quick. <laughs> so then I got the ladies all mad that the man actually stepped up. I said, well, you asked for it. You wanted him to. What, did you think he was going to do it perfect the five minutes he started doing it? It wasn't going to happen. So this is the kind of stuff we have. I got a bunch of people come in and say, well, you know, I've been praying for my husband to step up, and now he has, and I'm miserable. <laughs> That's because you never learned how to then let go and let him have the reins back. This is a mess. It's a huge mess. All right, group therapy is on pause. We'll go now to our resident therapist, Janet. <laughs> Rabbi, I don't know how much to say how much I appreciate uh, you um, for allowing us to come before you as the, spoke, you know, the spokesperson of, for Ava to answer questions. I really appreciate it because a lot of the questions are heavy and I have one that is a bit heavy, mm -hmm. but I know that Yahweh will give you the wisdom. So, and it's related to what you just said. So it's about the Yetzir Hara or the evil inclination. So, and I love what you said, you know, that's why he gave us a finite kind of life, because otherwise we'll be some, you know, we will do terrible things. And we have seen that. And I don't know if it's getting worse, but for some reason I'm getting a lot more. Um, I've always worked with um, families who have been involved with child protection, you know, abuse and all the things that can go in the world. And... I guess my question is about whether evil is something that is willful or is uh, maybe something that it has to do with your ability to do that. Why I'm asking that question? Because there's a lot, there's a, I'm a very positive person. I try to help everybody that comes to me. But there is a percentage of people that I believe uh, you can call it in the psychopath or sociopath category and the antisocial personality disorder, but there is this inability to have any empathy. If you read the literature, it actually says there is not even conscious in them, and there is a part in the brain that governs that area. So how many of these people are actually made or created? And obviously, Abba Lawson, um, or not, but there is a purpose, I suppose. But I'd like to hear your thoughts. I don't even have a question. I just have no, some No, no, I, I understand what you're saying. I appreciate that, Rob. Thank okay, you. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay, so first of all, let's, let's take this from 
the basic structural point of view. Because people do get into this whole idea of separating out all bad things are from outside of you instead of from inside of you. Okay, so how does that play out? Because Christianity wanted to make it all about the devil and the demons and everything, but you would never do anything wrong. You, you were fine until they inserted themselves in your life. Okay, let's understand that you are a, well, the most complicated mechan you know, you know, existing mechanism on the world, in the universe, right? You are this incredibly compact, complex mechanism. And all the moving systems and all the interacting parts and all the chemistry and all the physical mechanics of it, we're expecting that none of that will go bad. And you know, we actually use phrases like somebody's wiring is bad. Right? Isn't that a phrase we use? Or a chemical imbalance. So here you have a sperm and the egg get together and then all this replica replication and everything happens so you finally end up with a, a baby. And the baby comes out and interacts with the world. Then the baby interacts with other chemistry and things. Okay, we eat, we drink, we, we breathe in all of this different stuff. We touch things. So we have all these other things affecting our wiring. Plus, like any computer system, we learn through experience, just like when you're trying to teach, you know, like an AI type of thing, you're you know, teaching it to learn from things that it's experiencing. So we learn from our nurture as well as our nature, right? We have our nature, which is how we maybe have some wiring issues and chemistry issues, but we also have the, the nurture, what we experience. So when you're talking about your sociopaths, all right, these are people that may have busted deficient wiring, so to speak. Chemistry that doesn't, we're supposed to have a conscience, but we don't all have consciences. We're supposed to have empathy, but we don't all have empathy. It's not a demon thing. It's not a, yeah, we intended it that way. When you put the very complex stuff systems together that make us what we are, sometimes it doesn't come out in, in proper function. Now, depending on how far off, we can work with that. We can fix that. We can make adjustments to that. We can learn. We can figure out chemically what's wrong, and maybe we can take different chemicals in or take some out of our system to help balance that. We can learn behavioral patterns that will help us to develop a more appropriate, less aberrant way of dealing with things, right? Okay. So let's take it, first of all, from that level of it. Now, the other factor is what you started off asking about, which is why you know, people do these, you know, let's get to hurrah and do some evil things. The same thing that drives some of the worst behavior also drives some of the best behavior just out of balance or adding a small factor that trips it up. Okay, in other words, the drive to succeed could also turn you into a ruthless, dictating, um, dominant, at, when at all costs person or it could help you to become a very generous, benevolent, successful person. But the same drive that initially moves you in the direction, it's the same. It's other factors that turn it into something for good or for evil, so to speak. Okay? And that has to do with other chemistry, other experiences, and other things. Okay? There are people, and you see this, I don't want to say movies are real life, but there are lots of movies I'm sure you've seen, and in the movies, there's a character in the movie, and some real horrible thing happens in their life, and because of that horrible thing, they go in a direction obsessively to try to do something or accomplish something, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's got evil in it because they're going to make somebody pay for what they experience, even though clearly they can't make the actual person pay. So they're going to make everybody pay. And so these are those connections that are made through nurture and nature. Some of it's chemistry and the, nurture, and the nature, how you were made. Some of it's the experience and what you attach to the experience. The demons are opportunists because the one who is in charge of them, the devil, is an opportunist. I don't believe, you don't have to agree with me, all right? I don't believe that they are initiators. In other words, they only can work with what's already there. If you don't want to do something, you're not going to do it. Now, unless they came to you and forced you, that's there. I'm saying, but you're not going to get inspired to go do something you never really wanted to do and then blame, well, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. Something in you still wanted to do that. Now, I know there have been people that have had experiences in a much more direct way where maybe they were threatened and made to do something. I'm talking about the general popular you know, experience of people is to end up doing something and going, well, I, I didn't want to do that. Yes, you did. That's why you did it. And the devil and the demons are there to cheer you on doing what you shouldn't do that you still want to do on some level. 
That's why I call them opportunists. Because if you don't have it in you, there's nothing to work with. And don't let that depress you thinking, wow, I had that in me? Yes, you did. We all have terrible things in us. And thankfully, most of us, most of the time, restrain all that. But we all have that in there. That stuff that's all about me and not about you, which makes me hurt you, makes me take advantage of you, makes me abuse you, makes me do whatever it is because it became about me and not you. And so all that's in there. And so it's like the alcoholic thing. I always use as an example. I've never been an alcoholic. I never cared to drink. I mean, I'll have a drink very rarely. I mean, like really rarely. A couple times a year, maybe, if somebody is having something at their house or whatever. And I never had the thought to get drunk because it was never in me. That doesn't make me better than all you alcoholics. All right? It just means that particular thing, which I'm using as a very, very sort of benign thing to point out compared to some other, you know, really you know, aberrant behavior, but that's a simple one to understand. So guess what the devil never does? And the demons, they never try to get me drunk. And by the way, that doesn't mean that I'm not having a lot of it offered to me on a regular basis, especially when I was younger. I go to parties where it's everywhere and I just didn't want it. I don't know why. I didn't have any real good reasons necessarily. I just didn't want it. I think part of it is that I'm such a go, go, go guy. The, the one time I did drink some beer when I was younger, all it did was make me tired, okay? I didn't get a buzz. I didn't even know why. I was like, I'm like, I'm not getting this. <laughs> I'm drinking. I'm not feeling any different because I was always so, you think I'm hyper now, forget it. You should have seen me back then. So all it did was slow me down and I didn't like being slowed down. So I guess that's maybe the one main reason why, you know? But the thing is, the devil can't do anything with that. He can lay it in front of me and put it in front of my face as much as he wants. I'm not going to drink it or, or take it because it's not me. I don't want it. Okay? Not for some self-righteous reason. I just never wanted it for my own reasons. But if you wanted it on any level and it was put in front of you, you'd take it. Or you'd certainly be tempted to take it. But you'd have to want it. Okay? You know, some people will come to me to try to tempt me with some, you know, really crazy dessert thing, whatever. And I just look at them like, but I don't like those kinds of desserts. It doesn't matter, whatever. I'm not, I'm not, I don't like that. Okay? I mean, I do like desserts, don't get me wrong. I'm not a big cake guy. So a lot of times people want to come by with cake and I'm like, okay, I'll take it just to be polite, but I'll have one bite and not really want it. I don't, I'm not, a, that's just not my thing. So you can't tempt me with it. And so we all have our things. You bring in some fresh made, you know, chocolate chip cookies I made, then <laughs> have a little temptation. Do you understand? We're all different that way. So the opportunist that the demons and the devil are is to take residence where they know you're already living with that lust, that desire, that behavior that's not appropriate that you still, for whatever reason, don't tell me you don't want to do it. I know on one level you don't, but there's a part of you that does, and that's the only reason you do it. Because if you really didn't want to do it, you wouldn't do it. And we all know that's true. Everything in your life that you really don't want to do, you don't do. People say, well, I do things all the time I don't do. Well, you don't want to, he's not a strong enough feeling yet. You just, you don't really care to do it, but you don't, it's not like, I don't want to do that. I don't like it. Then you're not doing it. And people say to me, well, blah, blah, blah. And I say, no. And they'll try to give me other times. I say, no. And they look at me like, I say, I, I don't want to do it. Some of you have seen that when it comes to the, you know, sometimes after services, after we eat, then we go out later. And someone will say, hey, well, come out with us. No. Oh, we're going to go to this place. Doesn't matter. If I don't want to go, I don't want to go. Okay? And I'm not a very social guy when it comes to that kind of stuff, so I have to be in a very specific mood to do it. And almost always it has to be my wife asking me or I'm not going. Because I only go really because she wants me to go. And it's nothing personal to you guys. I just don't have that, you know, that inclination, so to speak, right? Okay? I don't have that desire. So what it really comes down to is balancing what needs to be balanced in your life, emotionally and chemically. The emotional stuff could be you were raised in such a poor uh, nurturing environment or you know, nurturing you in a bad way, but like you learned from what you experienced in such a bad way, you gotta retrain yourself now and get new experiences. That's what some of the people that you know, kind of call me dad, you know, who never really had a good father, are learning how that can help them to have someone they can call dad. And I've watched 
incredible changes come upon them when they go from just thinking it's a good idea, I'm going to try and call you dad, to when they actually see me as their dad. And how that just, the turnaround is tremendous. And it's not because of me, it's just because they have something they've always needed that they never had. And all of us can do things like that for people. You could be something they need that they never had. Some people haven't had a real friend. Some people haven't had a real sister. Some people haven't had a real brother. Even though they may have four or five sisters or four or five brothers, but they didn't have a right one. Okay? Some people may not have had a big sister, but they've been a big sister. Maybe they need one. Maybe they've never had a little sister, but they've been a big one, and they've had only a big one, but they like to be able to switch the roles. Same thing with the brothers. You could say the same thing, a big brother versus a, being like a little brother. There are things that you could really benefit from in life if you allow other people in your life to come into those roles naturally as they kind of evolve into it. All right? I don't mean go around like I do offering. And I only offer it to ones who, when it becomes obvious, their big problem is they never had a dad and they need a dad. And then I say, if you'd like, I can do that for you. And so that, that's how that works out there. So Janet, hopefully that makes some sense because the sociopaths and the people with the disconnections, if they don't find ways to fix that, they're going to just end up in the garbage heap, so to speak, because they're, they're the wiring that just, you know, there are, there, there are defective items. I'm not talking about like birth defects type of things. I mean, defective items up, up here more than just physically. The physical defective stuff, that stuff is something Abba will fix that into the millennium, into the kingdom. Not worried about that. But it's when the wiring is all bad, Sometimes it's not fixable. It's just that it was just one of those things that went through the, went through the factory and put, came together wrong. And it's sad. So I'm not saying that in any cold way. Because there are bad people. And they're bad because their wiring is bad. And nothing is going to rehab that for a lot of them. They're just wired poorly. There are things that are missing that would balance out. So when I say wired poorly, by the way, I don't want you to uh, say, I want to do this. Okay, I want to make this distinction. I don't want you to think that their wiring's bad, meaning the bad things are there that shouldn't be. What they're missing is the stuff that would balance it. We all could kill somebody. We all could murder somebody, right? We could all take, have sex with somebody we shouldn't. We could all steal something. We could all, whatever commandment you want to point to, we could all do anything. But we have, most of us, a strong enough balancing thought process and emotional position to say, no, I'm not doing that today. Okay? And so the ones who I call are bad people, they're bad not because they're bad, they're bad because they're missing good. Does that help? And so the bad's been able to flourish unchecked. Under the right circumstances, every one of you could be just as bad as any one of them. You could. Some of you already know that because you might have already been that and now you're not anymore. I'm serious. So don't think that bad people are bad just because they're not bad because they're missing something good that would balance it that they just can't seem to get their wiring to connect to. But if you want it bad enough, you'll figure it out and you'll find the workarounds and you'll be able to bring that into, you can reprogram your system. Okay, the bad people generally don't do that because they don't think they're bad. They just think they're being. This is just who I am. I like raping and pillaging and murdering or whatever else they might be doing out there, which back you know, a few hundred years is what people literally did. And they loved it. They just go with a bunch of their other psycho friends and they go into a town and they steal everything and they rape the women and they kill everybody they want, set everything on fire and then leave with whatever they wanted to take. And they loved it because they didn't have the balancing positive focus and they had the reinforcement that they got some sort of pleasure out of the bad. Because you, you can get pleasure out of doing good or bad. Matter of fact, some of you are, are wired in such a bad way because of the abuse you had that you find it really hard to receive good because you're used to only finding ways to get pleasure out of pain. I mean, how can somebody love me just to love me and not, like, treat me badly? Because everybody who ever loved you, at least you thought they did, treated you badly. So you keep waiting for the person to treat you badly. Because you made wrong connections. <clears throat> so you got to fix the wiring. 
That's why you go to Janet and you go to me and you get some counseling. All right? Okay? And she'll do brain spotting or whatever, and I'm just going to look at your brain and tell you what's wrong. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> hey, we each have our te techniques. All right. Tommy. All right. Thanks, Rabbi. Um, this is actually a question for my, uh, my wife, who couldn't be here today. She's been sick the past couple of times we've done these things, so I don't know what that means. But She's allergic to zone meetings. That, maybe that's what it is. She just wants me to be up here instead of her, I think. Oh. <clears throat> uh, so she basically was asking me about the, this this morning. Is, um, so a while back we went through the Psalms challenge, and right. she, <laughs> every time she started reading, she had a song, uh, an old church song pop up in her head because her mima, who pretty much raised her, um, sang those things all the time. And to be honest, I had it happen too multiple times because I could just see the old hymnal. Sure. <laughs> so, sure. Um, so her question is kind of around that. And then I don't know if it was last week, but you talked about I think it's First John five, the faith faith is the victory verse and. She had that song pop up too. Right, so. right. So uh, her question kind of is, um, so my recommendation to her when I heard it was, okay, so just go back to the teaching, you know, listen to it again. Hopefully the song doesn't pop up this time and you can consume what was intended. Um, but then she asked me, well, what if it's just reading through something? And I was like, yeah, I don't really know about that. All so. right. Yeah. Look, don't, don't worry about songs popping up. I mean, it's, it's what are you going to do in your reaction to it once it pops up? Are you going to sing the whole song? Are you going to recognize, oh, look what popped up in my head. Look, there are certain psalms that I know, you know are, are from popular, from hymnals that we use and everything else. And so as soon as we, I go to read that psalm, that happens to me often enough too, where that, that particular tune will pop into my head. But you, ha you can retrain yourself, though, by replacing it with something else. I'll give you an example. We all sang Lion of Judah today. But that was Brianna's version, not the original version. I can't even get the original version in my head anymore because I'm so used to her version. Okay? And they're not anywhere like it's even the same song. Okay? It's even those the exact same words, but it's so different. So you can reprogram with effort over time how you respond to something by putting something else there. So having heard her perform that song her way for so long, that's the only way that comes to my head now when I think of that song. And the, the original version, I'd have to actually pause and think about, okay, how did that go again? Because I'm so used to hers, all right? And so don't, it's not like evil and terrible and bad that a hymnal song pops in your head. It's just you don't want to go back into that church mindset. So you're like, oh, okay, I remember this from church and this song and everything. And it plays in your head for a second and it's sort of nostalgic and then just move on. Don't let it distract you. Don't get all upset about it. You are doing what normal, this thing that we talked about, factory made thing that the creator gave us, is supposed to respond to stimulus that it experienced over time when another stimulus happens similar enough, triggers it again, okay? Which is why we have what's called little buttons people can push, those triggers, right? Because it's happened enough and we've established that if this thing happens, it's similar enough to what happened way back when, it triggers the same response. So you start reading. The, the, when I was in Worldwide Church of God, there was a, uh, the first song in the hymnal was also Psalm 1, okay? And so I knew that one. I knew it the way they did it. So if I was reading Blessed and Happy is the Man, blah, 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 for Psalm 1, I'm hearing that in my head. So I know, the, I know what, what Selena would be talking about, okay? However, I'm not going to sit there and just kind of sing it along with it, you know, because then it puts me back there. I'm just going to get back to just reading the psalm, and if I need to get the music out of my head, I can play something else in the background quietly so that does it if I need to. But I don't need to go back in the mindset to back in those days when I was in that building doing those things. All right? Okay. Because, I mean, after all, they're just words of the Psalms' words, and you just have a tune to it. There's nothing bad about that in itself. It's the Psalm. <laughs> so it's not like it's a mainstream Christian song with their own words and their own agenda to it. It's just the Psalm. However... 
what you don't want is to end up back mentally and emotionally in that space. Okay? All right, Ashley. Shabbat shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat shalom. Um, thank you for everything you said back there. I felt like it was Wednesday at 1130 for the few people that know about that in the room. <laughs> um, give me a second here. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay with you. Um, one is, because um, I'm trying to um, change who I am um, for the better, um, what happens if I notice, and it doesn't mean it's happening or anything yet, because I know a lot of people are coming brand new into the body, and I'm expecting to happen sooner than later. What happens if someone comes in, and it gets my own self to go, ooh, like, because re- that memory, it remembers, you know, how I used to be. How do I, is it appropriate to, and that person wants to hang out with me, is it appropriate to say, no, I can't hang out, how would I, how would I do that without, like, being rude to them, but know that I'm, I'm not ready to try to work on that yet because I have so many other things I'm working on. Okay. All right. So this is a good question for those of you that don't know what to counsel about. Because, I mean, people say to me, oh, I made an appointment because you said I need to counsel. Well, no, you need to counsel if you need to counsel. I mean, you don't have to counsel just because you need, you know, because I said so. But there are things that you should get counsel about. That would be one of them. You have a reaction that triggers something from your old way of life. And so with some aspect of that, and you really don't know how to handle it appropriately, then you call and set up your appointment or you talk to me, and then we can talk it through and say, okay, what were you feeling? What were you thinking? What's going on emotionally, et cetera? What's being triggered? What are you reliving? And we can process that to the place where either you will be able to or not able to interact with that person that way, at least temporarily, till you get some of that sorted out. And then how do you explain it to them? We can talk about the right way to do that too. Okay, these are things that you would counsel for, okay? But for those of you that are out there, because I know some of you come here, oh, I don't know, I'm just here because you said I need to. Well, you probably do need to, but you got to think about what it is you need, though. What do you need guidance, advice with? What's going on in your life that needs some sort of a, a, a mentoring to kind of get to the next level from where you're sort of stuck? So in this case, it also comes up when things come up that you don't know what to do. So she's in the congregation, somebody walks in, it starts to trigger something from her past, and now she doesn't know what to do. So the best thing to do is be as polite as you can in that moment until you get a chance to talk to me about what you should do. Okay? okay? What's your next question? Um, my next one is, um, and I don't know where it is in here, um, we briefly talked about it a couple weeks ago, it was that thing in The Chosen with that lady that was bleeding and all that. Um, I guess it's, that's a two-part question, sorry. Where is that one in the Bible? Because I want to read that story. Matthew 9, 20. Remember that. <laughs> um, the other, um, regarding... That's the woman with the issue of blood, right? Yeah. Um, where she grabbed his seat seats? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Matthew 9, 20. Okay. okay. Um, when, um, when Yeshua comes back, um, and if... I'm, I don't know how that's going to look in the end, but if I'm still like this in the millennium or whatever have you, but if I am, how do I know, because I'm working on trying to figure out when it's appropriate to approach someone, and maybe this is another counseling question, and I apologize, but um, how do I know when it's appropriate to go up to him, because I just, I can't wait for the day. If I'm not healed by then, I can just grab his tate seats. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't think... <laughs> Okay, as far as Yeshua, when, when, in, when you finally do get to see him, I don't think he's going to care how you go up to him, okay? Any of us. He's going to just want to hold anybody and everybody and just go up to him, okay? Um, whatever you think we do hug time-wise, it'll be like nothing compared to, you know. Okay, so I wouldn't worry about that, all right? So as far as, um, but anybody else in this fleshly world, you know, you should get counsel about who you can approach and what's the right approach before you just approach different people. Okay, you already know how you can be with me. You, already, you know how you can be with Elder. And there are different people that you already know how you can be with, okay? Did that answer the question? No. Okay, re-explain your question. He's going to give you the mic. Um, what I mean is if I'm not, have all this junk cleared in my head um, to where I can be, not normal, but better version of me, um, and I can see him, can I, like, if I see him, like, on a mountain, and I'm over here, can I just book it, and when I catch up to him, grab a CC, or is that, whatever that protocol, Whatever protocols will be in place, you'll understand them at the time. 
Okay, I can't say yes or no how that's going to work, what, you know, where he's going to be, if he's sitting there in Jerusalem on the throne and, and, and whatever protocols there are to, to interact and who you may need to talk to first or whatever, but you'll know what those are. Now, it will be clear to everyone what the protocols are. Okay? okay, thank you. Okay. But what I will reassure you is you do not need to be or think that you need to be perfect before you'll be able to interact with him. You don't have to have all your junk fixed. As long as you're still alive, there'll be time to fix your junk. Okay? So if you're in the millennium, you'll have the millennium to fix all that, okay? And if you're not there, well, then you're not there, you won't even know. <laughs> okay, because you'll just be sleeping and that'll be the end of it. Okay, Michael? I may need some help unpacking this one a little bit. Because I've been reading the scriptures a lot um, with Constantine, and he asks me some really amazing questions from time to time. And usually I can answer them when I can't. I turn to the scriptures, and when I can't find the answer there, I find an answer, and it's too cumbersome for me to try to unpack. Then I, of course, ask for a counseling session with you for him, you know, um, but that hasn't happened in a little while. So, but I ended up in Galatians one day. This was, I was actually reading on my own this time, but I saw this bit in Galatians 3 starting in uh, verse 23. Before a belief came, we were being guarded under Torah, having been shut up for the belief about to be revealed. Therefore, the Torah became our trainer unto Messiah in order to be declared right by belief. Now, when I'm reading about the fruits of the Spirit, the works of the flesh, you know, when I'm reading the Torah, when I'm reading about, you know, stories like Korach and, you know, like what we read just last night, for example, you know, it occurs to me that when we are complaining, when we're feeling uh, dissension, when we're feeling you know, rebellion, when we're feeling those things that can cause us to do things that are not going to be advantageous for our walk, it occurs to me that those originate from the heart, from the lust of the flesh, from the desire of the flesh to do whatever the flesh wants to do, and it is the mind of Yeshua that has to conquer that. It's the mind you know, um, that's been infused with Torah. And so just to kind of unpack this a little bit, like where I'm going with it anyway, because I might need your help with the rest of it, is that um, the Torah became our trainer unto Messiah in order to be declared right by belief. I don't know if I have this entirely correct, but I believe on a scientific level, or a more scientific level anyway, it is the subconscious mind is the only thing that has the power over emotions in those who are maybe a little bit weaker cognitively you know, to be able to use their conscious mind to overpower their emotions, which I would be one of those people. You know, so my, my subconscious mind is routinely stronger than my emotional mind. And I think that if one would study the Torah and actually live it and walk it and do it for long enough, then they become it on a subconscious level. So that when they run into a problem, you know, where the, the inclination of the heart, the, you know, is, is fighting against the mind of Yeshua, that they might actually be able to win over for Yeshua in that time. Is, is that correct? Does, it, does that make any sense? Do I need to have that unpacked a little more? Or? Well, all right. So he's trying to give us an understanding. I think you're probably in the right direction, in, in, if I'm understanding you correctly, that let's take the word belief and change that to being. Okay? So before being came... We were guarded under Torah, having been shut up before for the being, uh, for the belief being about to be revealed, for us, for us becoming what we're supposed to. It's a becoming. So it says, therefore, the Torah, the Torah became our trainer, so we could become Messiah-like, in order to be declared right by us being that. Because what's going to be have us declared right is us being Messiah-like. He says, but after we become Messiah-like, there's no longer need for a trainer. That doesn't mean the law goes away, but you don't need a trainer. You, it's now what you are as opposed to what you do. Okay? You're being instead of doing. All right? You have to go from I, I'm, I'm doing Sabbath to I'm a Sabbath, I am a Sabbath keeper. I'm being Sabbath observant, right? I'm being Torah observant as opposed to I'm doing Torah. Okay, so you need the trainer to make you do because you don't want to do. To make you do because you don't understand. To make you do for all these various reasons, but when you become, you do them because you already understand all that. 
So you don't need a trainer. Okay, so like, let's say I was your personal trainer and I took you to the gym and I met with you there once a week or whatever it was that we're meeting, two, three times a week just to get you going and started. And then once I've shown you how to do and what to do and the right ways to do and got you on a program, you would not need me anymore unless you decide to just be lazy-minded because then you're going to pay me basically to motivate you. You already know everything else to do. There's no reason to pay me. And I had clients like that when I was a personal trainer who literally just wanted me to babysit them. They already knew what to do where to go, how to do it, how to use the machines and everything else. They just wanted to pay somebody, otherwise they were too lazy to do it. And the only reason they were doing it is because they paid me. But they didn't need me. They needed to motivate themselves through the pain of paying me, made them do it. So the Torah, once you've been doing it, how often do you actually go back and reference the Torah to make sure, oh, when, when is the Sabbath again? Oh, the seventh day? Oh, what am I? I mean, you know it. You live it. You don't have to go back and constantly have it in your face. And does that help kind of go along with what you were saying? It does. Um, but um, to, to kind of take that a step further is like, yeah, I mean, great progress because I know that you know, this is the Sabbath day and, you know, I'm doing what I can to keep that now, but, you know, my mind is still my mind and that thing just goes off, off the rails mm -hmm. quicker than anything. And so, um, even like on Shabbat, you know, I can routinely be thinking about stuff that's not Shabbat worthy to be thinking about, you know, or having conversations that are not Shabbat worthy to be having. And so, um, one of the, one of the biggest fears that I have, and this is, you know, I've poured my heart out about this to a, a couple of people in the past is that, um, I don't, I, when I close my eyes and I think about my walk and I meditate on that, I imagine I'm in the end of days and the city is here and the king is seated on the throne and I'm approaching the gate. And I think about how it would feel if he said, depart from me. Right. And that just crushes me to, to take that in, in that way, to that depth. And like these these momentary problems that I'm having, you know, with things like the Shabbat or, you know, uh, pretty much anything else, inclinations of my heart, whatever, you know, or when I get angry or upset for reasons that, you know, nobody else has any part of, you know. So how, how, how do I reconcile? Like, like are, are we going to get, basically what I'm asking is, are, is this, because we've had our eyes open, been called to this in this life, is this our only chance or do we get an additional chance in the millennium? I just, I just don't know. All right, all right. Okay. <laughs> That's a long way to get to that question. Sorry. Because um, the other questions, well, the rest of it was more, look, let's understand, before I get to that, let me try to kind of cover what you mostly were talking about, which is that we, we are still in need of a trainer. Okay, there's a reason why he commands us to have Shabbat services, not just keep the Shabbat. Because if you, for all of those who stay home who could be here, I'm not talking about the ones who are home that don't have any place to go. But some of you that stay home when you could be here, you're putting yourself in temptation's way. Because if you're home by yourself when you could be here, you'll be much more tempted to do things you shouldn't do than if you're here. And so these are things he gives us as trainers or things to help us to you know, handle where we could be weak. We're not really just ready to be off on our own because on your own, the more you have time to be by yourself, the more you have time to like, be in your own head, the more you have time to get in all kinds of trouble. All right, so that's, that's part one of this. And so, yes, we still need a trainer. But he's saying that ultimately, when you are completely being Messiah-like, which means keeping all the commandments and everything else, but you're doing it because it's who you are, then you would have less need of a trainer because you're already trained. And so now you do it without thinking. You don't need to be trained anymore. Okay, I don't know about you, but I can often find myself leaving this building and home and not remember the drive. I'm well trained. I know how to get in my car, turn it on, go, out, go from here to my house without really paying hardly any attention to it. Guess what? You can keep the commandments that way too. because you do. And I didn't drive badly or anything else, like, so it's not like I needed to pay attention. I don't have to pay that much attention to eat right and keep Sabbath and not murder somebody, not steal, not commit adultery, not do this, not do that. Okay, I've learned most of those things I can do by the fact that it's who I am now. Okay, not everything. And so that's part of it. The other part of it is you're transforming from receiver to giver. Because when you're in needing the trainer, you're needing to receive. 
when you get well trained, now you can be useful to give as well. And so that's the transformation we're looking to make. Now to answer your question, listen to the Millennium and Kingdom of Teaching again and again. There are no second chances. However, nobody on this planet is qualified to tell you whether or not this is your first chance. First chance means that your bubble was popped and that you've been revealed to you the choices lay before your life and death, as Moses would say, and that you made your choices. How that plays out into the millennium? You know, you may be alive when it starts and you'll be right, go right into the millennium. You won't be changed in that first resurrection. Maybe you'll be just going to have to live in the millennium and finish the process if you haven't finished it at this point. Those are way above anybody's pay grade for us here on this planet. Okay, I just know that he's a fair and just Elohim. He's not a respecter of persons. Everybody must get the same opportunity. So nobody gets two, but nobody gets zero. And so that's why I said that for some people who have died throughout history and never even knew about a Messiah, never heard of the Torah, never heard of any of that stuff, they didn't get their one chance. They lived a life, which is why we have a thing called the second death. Can't be a second death without a second life. So some people will get a second life, but it'll be a first chance. But for all of you that are right now, it says judgment is now on the house of Elohim. All right, well, let's take that seriously, like you obviously do from what you said, that that scares you to death to think, you know, you want to hear those well done, good. So let's work on all the things now that you need to do to become that person that he, want, that he wants to use those words with. Tell you well done. Don't be, don't be banking on the millennium for anything. I mean, some of you might get that anyway, but I wouldn't be banking on it. Go, ah, this is too hard. I'll wait for the millennium. That's, that's the attitude he's going to be judging. He's going to be looking at your putting it off and saying, ah, you know. I don't know why anybody thinks the millennium is going to be so much better and easier. I mean, you have Gog and Magog and Hasatan at the end of it, and a whole bunch of people go with them. So clearly... The millennium didn't fix anything as far as that's concerned. People still made the same choices they're making now. And so it's just a different time frame and a different period and some things are going on just a little bit differently because Yeshua is sitting on the throne, etc. But it is a period of time that is for first chancers or someone that hasn't completed their process and Abba wants to give you more time to complete it because he's not about, well, too bad, I gave you your time and you were close, but no. The thing that I think gets you in trouble is quitting, okay? As long as you want it and want it and want it and try as hard as you can, he may give you more time in the millennium to do that and finish it, but you need to just always show him the Deuteronomy 8-2 test, that yes, you can be humbled, and yes, you can pass the test of showing them that you're, it's in your heart to want to do these things. You may not do them all right, but you want to, which means you feel bad when you don't. Okay? Did that help? Greatly. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Um, last question, if I may? <laughs> Go ahead, quick. All right. As, um, as a husband of one of your adopted daughters, who is making great progress, by the way, how... How and I'm asking this more ambiguously rather than specifically. I'll see you for a counseling session for specifics on this. But how how can I accommodate her growth as she's rounding this curve that she's rounding right now? Um, well, actually, that's more like two questions because one has to do with me, one doesn't. So all of you out there need to understand that anybody that's working with me, I do nothing and will never do anything that usurps an existing male role. If you have a husband, I'm not usurping the husband role. Ashley needs a father, but she has a husband. And so I don't do anything that interferes with that. Michael knows that. He's been to the sessions and all that. Okay, but just so you know that I may be acting like a, 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 a papa dad role of some sort for that person, it has zero, zero um, disrespect for the roles that already exist, okay? Because I will not do that. Okay, and, and sometimes one of the daughters will ask something. I'll say, no, I can't do that. You need to go ask your husband. You need to go talk to the person that you're actually supposed to talk to. I'm glad you asked me, but I'm going to send you back over there. And if that doesn't work out the way, that, then maybe we need to all three have a conversation. Then we're just having a counseling session, okay? But it's not like I'm going to be your father and tell your husband what he needs to do. 
I can be your rabbi and tell your husband what he might need to do. That's a whole different thing, okay?